So Connor described 11 children, eight boys, three girls. The ages range from two to eight. And the clinical features that he described included impaired socialization, idiosyncratic language, repetitious behavior, and unusual responses to sensory stimuli. He described these children as aloof, withdrawn, with limited eye contact, and uh, indifference to others. He described language that included echolalia. The suffix L-A-L -L means language. So in England, la 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 is lalling, what we call babbling. If you remember the word onomatopoeia from high school poetry, like clippity-clop sounds like a horse, buzz-buzz sounds like a bee. So the word lalling sounds like what babies do, which is la 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 la. But L-A-L -L means language. So echolalia is echo speech. You say to the child, want a cookie? And he says in the exact same voice, want a cookie? Instead of saying, yeah, he'll echo it back. Delayed echolalia refers to the rote repetition of phrases hours or days later. That's also nowadays called scripting. A child may fall down, and as the child is dusting himself off, the child may say, are you all right, Johnny? In other words, he's repeating what has been said to him in the past under those circumstances. Or as one of my patients came out with when the movie Stuart Little was very popular, the child said, you don't eat your friends, which is what the mother cat says to the kitten vis-a-vis -vis not eating Stuart Little, but he was coming out with fragments of the movie. Pronoun reversal, which is really a special example of delayed echolalia, because if you say to the child, do you want a cookie? And the child, knowing that that's the phrase that's uttered within the context of being offered cookies, may go up to the parent and say, you want a cookie? He's really engaging in delayed echolalia rather than having difficulty with ego boundaries and confusing who I am for who you are. He's just echoing the phrase. And then odd inflection. So if I were to talk like this for the rest of the morning, within about 30 seconds, most of you would be headed for the exits because prosody, which is the melody, is something we all take for granted. It's like art and pornography. You know, you don't know how to define it, but you know it when you see it. The same is true for prosody. And the first time you hear a child who has abnormal prosody, and it may be described as sing-song, stilted, robotic, pedantic, but it's, there's something about it that's very different. Um, it'll, it'll arrest your attention, and from then on, you will listen with that kind of third ear, and you'll be able to pick it out. And I've often claimed, and nobody's put me to the test, that if you brought me audio tapes of children from some other culture where I don't speak the language, and nine of the tapes were of typically children who are neurotypical, and one was of a child on the spectrum, I'd be able to pick it out by the, the prosody. And I've actually had that experience with parents who are American grad students studying overseas, where the, the foreign-speaking instructors in the other language were able to, to do that. Rigid routines. Um, who in this hall has not seen the movie Rain Man? So you've all seen Rain Man. OK, so that scene, two minutes to Wapner. Got to see Wapner, you know? And Tom Cruise's character had to find a roadside bar and grill with a TV because it was two minutes to Wapner. Um, very rigid, very repetitious. And we're going to talk a lot more about that as we go along. Um, cognitive rigidity refers to that mindset. Two minutes to Wapner, got to see it. Stereotypies, and that's the British pronunciation. I used to think that was an affectation, but everybody on both sides of the Atlantic pronounce it that way. Stereotypies are things like flapping, spinning, toe walking, and nobody is quite sure to this day why people on the spectrum do it, but they do it. And then lining up objects and those kind of physical things. Uh, Connor described all of these. And then he also gave equal weight and I want to emphasize that the American Psychiatric Association st still treats this as a diagnostic step child, which I think is a mistake in terms of criteria. Uh, be that as it may, um, Connor, I think, got it right, and he described unusual sensory attractions or aversions, the child who is petrified of the vacuum cleaner, singing happy birthday to you, often 
drives kids on the spectrum bananas. Um, children were either drawn to or afraid of. They would have this kind of approach avoidance response to high stimulus items, mouthing or sniffing of non-food objects. And then um, paradoxically, um, extreme food selectivity, only eating six things. And I've had parents who will say to me, you know, um, I realize that Kraft Foods changed the formulation of their mac and cheese because all of a sudden my child started turning up his nose at it and I wrote to the company and sure enough they had made one minor substitution in the ingredients. Or one family who went to the length of uh, getting a, a whole stack of Burger King hamburger wrappers so that they could wrap up a McDonald's burger in the Burger King wrapper if there was no Burger King available, child is not to be fooled. For a complete copy of Dr. Connor's paper, go to www.drcopeland.com and click on Related Links.